Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Montgomery County Council. This morning, we will begin with uh, a proclamation rec recognizing vaccine hunters. Let me thank you all for all your hard work um, under very difficult circumstances to keep our residents safe. And I'll turn it over to Council Member Reamer. Thank you, Council President Tom Hucker. It's really such a privilege to be able to recognize the work of this dynamic team. Uh, we are joined today by a group called the Vaccine Hunters. There are eight women who teach in Montgomery County Public Schools. And for the past number of weeks, they have been working to help disadvantaged county residents who are, who are disadvantaged in this incredible, diff incredibly difficult digital process of getting appointments uh, to secure life-saving appointments to get vaccinations. And um, one of the privileges of being a county council member is the opportunity to recognize community leaders. And uh, the vaccine hunters are part of a national movement that is grassroots leadership in this moment of crisis coming together to promote equity in the rollout of one of the most significant government operations in the history of our country, which is the distribution of life-saving vaccinations. Um, so we are, we are honored to be here today with Maisie Lynch, Tanya Aguilar, Becky Taylor, Maria Peterson, Tanya Perez Fuentes, Dina Ciccioni, Courtney Mason, Kathleen Bartels. And we have a proclamation. I'm joined today by Councilmember Evan Glass, Councilmember Nancy Navarro, Councilmember Gabe Albernos. And uh, I know everyone will, will join uh, in making comments. So we're going to proceed first to read the proclamation, and then we will invite our uh, council members to make comments, and then we will have our vaccine hunters uh, who will have discussed who's going to speak on behalf of the group, and they'll share some reflections. Um, so again, we just wanna thank, thank the vaccine hunters for stepping in in a moment of need for, for so many. Um, I'll now begin to read the proclamation. Whereas the vaccine hunters Pascaza Vacunas was founded on the premise that educators mobilize and get the job done when a need arises in the broader community. They have marshaled their strength and compassion as they do in the classroom to address many of the inequities facing the most vulnerable in Montgomery County and surrounding counties with the vaccine rollout. And Councilmember Glass. And whereas when a COVID-19 vaccine was introduced, the group of eight educators sought to eliminate the inequitable distribution of the vaccine for those who are over 75, those in communities hit hardest by COVID-19 with a focus on Black and Latinx communities, and those residents who lack the information, computer skills, and or the language literacy to obtain a vaccine, and... Whereas the vaccine hunters, Las Casa Vacunas, organized volunteers and together dispersed accurate and timely information via social media in these communities, volunteer on site at vaccine clinics to ensure that residents know how to navigate the process, reach out to government and health officials to advocate for those in underserved communities, and through their tireless work have secured more than a thousand appointments for those who were unable to do so without their assistance and. Whereas the vaccine hunters, Las Casa Vacunas, make themselves available by phone, email, text message, and in person to the ind individuals they assist. They support individuals by assisting with the process of booking, preparing, and traveling to their appointments, providing on-site assistance as needed, including Spanish translation and follow up all with the goal of getting more shots in arms and. Whereas the vaccine hunters, Las Casa Vacunas, through social media and news networks, set a precedent for advocacy for accessibility and the equitable distribution of vaccines in communities hardest hit by COVID-19, inspiring others in Maryland, as well as across the country to help their neighbors, families, and friends. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby honors the vaccine hunters, Las Casa Vacunas, 
for their remarkable assistance to Montgomery County residents and those in neighboring counties <clears throat> throughout Maryland to improve the vaccine rollout throughout the COVID-19 pandemic signed by Council President Tom Hucker and myself. Thank you so much to the vaccine hunters. We are so grateful for your leadership. And again, it's no coincidence that you're teachers and that you're women and that you're leading our community through this crisis. Those three elements are integral and we're, we're grateful to you. I'll ask, invite my council colleagues for any reflection they'd like to share in that order, in the same order, and then we'll turn it to our community leaders. Great, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Hucker. And it is so good to see all of you incredible ladies this morning. And I know that you're taking time uh, out of your teaching, right, to, to be with us today. But, but essentially, that's what you've been doing over the last number of months. You have been teaching by day, logging long hours. Uh, and then once you log off of your educational platforms, you've been logging on to dozens and dozens of platforms trying to keep our residents healthy and safe. And if there is a silver lining, that has emerged from this pandemic. It is individuals like you who've been stepping up and working so hard to keep everybody healthy and safe. And uh, it is such a privilege to have all of you uh, working for our, our youth here in Montgomery County by day and working for our seniors and everybody else in the evening. And so thank you for everything that you've been doing. Well, good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. Uh, you know, it's just been a little bit over a year uh, since everything changed. And I think from that very moment, one of the things that has been so extraordinary to watch is how our residents have stepped up, even during this very difficult time under so much stress, to be so generous of spirit, to help each other. And there is no way that we could be where we are in this moment in time without gener the generosity of people like you. I mean, government can do a lot, but obviously this is such an extraordinary crisis that it requires everybody stepping up. And every time we talk about issues of equity, which we were very fortunate, I think, in Montgomery County to have spent an entire year in 2019 focusing on this issue that, you know, resulted in this uh, racial equity and social justice law. We can talk about that all day long, but the reality is that it is something that is out there uh, and it, it manifests itself in so many different terrible ways, such as the disproportionality that we see affecting our black and brown communities during this time, now especially with vaccines. And so for you to have had, you know, the absolute spirit of just stepping up and going in there, two very important examples. When you pointed out the issues with the Fremont sites translation, right, where people, instead of saying your race, basically said car race on there. When you started uh, talking about these issues of what pharmacies were doing, which, you know, we had started to hear from as well, it, it just really truly uh, sparks uh, an opportunity to address these issues as they come up. And it is at the grassroots level, because sometimes it doesn't bubble up to our level to figure out how we can advocate. So I just want to thank you. Muchisimas gracias. This is so imperative. You have demonstrated that there's just been a lot of chatter out there about hesitancy in especially black and brown communities. I haven't seen that. What I have seen is that people just want to be able to find that appointment. And you're making that possible. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And, you know, I was, I was thinking hopefully one day we won't need you. But you know what? We will continue to need that kind of assistance and that kind of structure because this is a long road ahead. And I believe that you have started an extraordinary movement right here in Montgomery County. I know it's national, but right here you have done things uh, that are just amazing and we should continue to partner with you. Thank you very much. And thank you for everything you do for our students and families as well. Well, that was well said. And thank you, Council Member Reamer for initiating this proclamation, which is so unbelievably well-deserved. About two months ago, I was starting to get emails and forwarding messages saying there's this Facebook page that's been set up, this group of teachers that have band together to help our community. And I checked out the Facebook page, I checked out the social media and confirmed what everyone had been saying. What you guys were able to stand up and put together so quickly was literally a lifeline. Uh, and so helpful in so many different ways. And then so a few weeks later, I had the opportunity to meet with all of you 
and was just blown away, blown away by your kindness, blown away by your leadership, by your sincerity, and also the way that you've been able to quickly adapt to the very fast moving situation with regards to the vaccines. You brought issues to my attention and to the county's attention that we needed to know, we needed to hear, which we have been able to work on. You've been advocating at the state level. And as council member Navarro said, the way that you've been able to help us focus on equity in a way that is so authentic and so real and so powerful is truly remarkable. So I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for your dedication and leadership. It's no surprise that all of you have chosen the profession of public service. Uh, you are exuding that in spades. And so I, I just can't thank you enough for all that you've done. The work will continue and your leadership we've learned from, we will build from, and thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Now, I would like to invite, uh, I'll begin with Ms. Lynch, Maisie. Good morning. Thank you all for those really kind words. Um, we we really, really appreciate it. Um, we really appreciate you recognizing this meaningful work for us. It seemed really simple at first, just helping people get appointments, and it's turned into something much bigger than any of us imagined. Um, collectively, these women have spent hundreds of hours learning about all aspects of the vaccine rollout. I, I continually tell people that we're sort of experts at this point, and um, it's not, it's because of the hard work and the long hours that have been put in. Um, it is the ability, uh, for, we, we really appreciate that we're having a chance to make a difference and you know, the, while the work the work has turned into something that none of us had imagined, we the human lives that we have touched, in addition to um, you know being able to work with each other and the relationships that we've all built as a group, have really just kept us going um, through this. Because as you all know, anything that has the word vaccine in it at this point um, means that it's long hours and hard hours of work. I the the amount of work that you all have done in um, this vaccine roll-up leading up to what all of us have experienced is just unbelievable. Um, our efforts to increase equity and, ex and accessibility, uh, driven by the desire for all of us to return to normal, have kept motivating us to advocate more and to work even longer hours in addition to our full-time teaching jobs towards this shared mission. One outcome that we never anticipated was that the vaccine hunters, Las Casa Vacunas, would have the opportunity to work with so many amazing people in Montgomery County and across the state. Um, you know, most of you don't know this, but Council Member Reamer, gets evening texts from us all the time. Um, he's in a, he never thought that he would be in a group text with eight teachers at night who are just like throwing out ideas and complaining about things, but he's been amazing in answering those. And, you know, we're having, he's met with us at nine, 10 o'clock at night when all the kids are finally asleep. And um, we really appreciate that. Many of you are done the same. Um, Council member Glass has let me text him for different things. So, you know, for us, it's such a, it, it feels such a, it's such a privilege, but it also just feels so right for all of us to be coming together to help solve the problems that we're dealing with right now. There are hundreds of people working behind the scenes who have this shared mission with the vaccine hunter, including other groups. We have some other individuals. I have to say Matt's name. I'm just gonna say Matt Hillenbrenner because he's been amazing with helping us. Um, and I, you know, other groups that have popped up, it's just been such an amazing experience for all of us. And we feel so fortunate to be at the table for many of the important conversations and to know that we're making um, an impact. It makes all the sleepless nights of checking websites and making appointments and planning lessons. And then the early mornings where we have to shake it all off and juggle our personal lives and our professional lives and get breakfast going and kids on Zoom and teach our classes. You know, I literally have been sitting in um, council, in meetings, eating dinner or making dinner and and it's just there's been a lot going on but it's so worth it so thank you guys for working with us to help everything get back to normal get more shots in arms and really significantly for us as well is for giving us the opportunity to be positive role models for both our own children and future generations of community leaders we really appreciate um, you allowing us to pave that way so thank you thank you so much would another of the vaccine hunters like to share a comment or a reflection? So I'm just gonna share something super quick. Um, Maisie did a, a fabulous job expressing our um, 
our thoughts and our feelings. Uh, pero quería decirlo un poquito en español. Quiero, des, quiero agradecerle a este concilio por el apoyo que nos ha brindado. Esto ha sido el orgullo, uno de los orgullos más grandes que nosotras como profesoras, como mujeres líderes, hemos experimentado, hemos vivido. Y deseamos seguir trabajando con este concilio, con nuestro condado, con los organizadores, eh, con nuestra comunidad vulnerable que son nuestro enfoque y son nuestra razón de, de estar juntas como un grupo. Esta comunidad nos necesita, estamos aquí para ellos, por ellos, y seguiremos abogando por todas sus necesidades hasta que, hasta que nos callen y aún así cuando nos callen seguiremos trabajando por esta comunidad. Así que gracias por esta oportunidad y, y este, seguiremos luchando en, sol en solidaridad. Thank you so much for starting something so special. We are so grateful to you and you embody so much love for community and we're just here to support you and we'll keep working with you and we hope you'll keep working and we'll find new ways to support your mission going forward. Thank you so much for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council President. You bet. Thank you all so much for all your hard work and your service. Uh, let me turn it over to uh, Councilmember Friedson because we're all very excited. It's Bethesda's 150 ber 150th birthday. Councilmember Friedson. Thank you, Council President. I got to say, Bethesda looks pretty good for 150. Absolutely. I am particularly excited because uh, it's uh, not just a celebration of Bethesda's 150th birthday, it's my nephew Jonah's sixth birthday today. So it's a dual birthday celebration. Happy birthday to Jonah, who is in school right now, um, <clears throat> very happy to be joined by a great group of people who uh, really represent uh, the commitment to community that Bethesda is and has been. Uh, Wendy Kaufman, the president of the Bethesda Historical Society, who is uh, helping us to be sure that we remember our roots. Uh, we have uh, Dave Dabney, uh, in his uh, classic red, uh, former executive director of the Bethesda Urban Partnership, who uh, in my uh, local activism and my old state government role, uh, I used to just call him Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jeff Burton, uh, who has taken over as the current dir executive director of Bethesda Urban Partnership that really is at the heart of uh, sustaining Bethesda's quality of life and making it such a great place to, to live, work, play and stay. We have Ken Hartman uh, from the Bethesda Chevy Chase Regional Services Center, who uh, has uh, been uh, the person out there on behalf of county government, really uh, helping to serve uh, residents. Uh, we have Janan Italiano, the uh, just recently former, I have to get used to saying, former president and CEO of the Bethesda Chamber of Commerce, uh, who's been the voice of our local businesses in the greater Bethesda area for many years. And Allie Williams, who, just joined the Bethesda Chamber of Commerce and is trying uh, and doing great in filling uh, Janan's uh, uh, enormous shoes. And uh, we also uh, should be joined, I'm not sure if you said on video, by Carol Trawick of the Trawick Foundation, who has been uh, for decades one of the leading business, civic, and philanthropic leaders uh, in Bethesda that really highlights uh, what it means to commit to and give back to uh, community, to uh, share blessings uh, with uh, community members. Uh, so I'll turn it over in a few minutes uh, to uh, get remarks, but I wanted to just read this uh, proclamation uh, that we have uh, quickly. Um, this is a proclamation of the Montgomery County Council. Uh, whereas on January 23rd, 1871, the community previously called Darcy's Store in reference to former postmaster William E. Darcy's general store officially became known as Bethesda after the nearby Bethesda Meeting House. And whereas Bethesda has grown from a rural crossroads village to a global destination and is now home to more than 60,000 residents and 600 businesses, along with some of the most prominent entertainment venues and organizations in the greater capital area. And whereas Bethesda has brought notoriety to the region with internationally acclaimed performances from the Bethesda Arts and Entertainment District and has emerged as a magnet for unrivaled talent with global headquarters for some of the world's most successful and admired companies and as an international leader in the sciences 
being home to the National Institute of Health and Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. And whereas the Bethesda Historical Society was established in 2019 as a nonprofit volunteer organization dedicated to preserving, sharing, and reflecting on the history of the Bethesda area and its diverse residents by developing educational programs and focusing on significant locations and important moments like this one in Bethesda history. And whereas with organizations such as Bethesda Urban Partnership, Bethesda Cares, the Treywood Foundation, and many others, Bethesda is a purpose-driven community that turns altruism into action, truly reflective of its namesake, which means house of loving kindness. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Council today honors and celebrates Bethesda's 150th birthday, and be it further resolved that the County Council recognizes that Bethesda has and continues to provide a thriving residential, business, art, science, and culinary community for the residents of Montgomery County and beyond. Presented on this 16th day of March in the year 2021, also known as Jonah's birthday, signed by myself, District 1 Council Member Andrew Friedson, and Council President Tom Hucker. Happy birthday, 150th, looking good, everybody. Uh, really appreciate it. And I will just say we have a group of people here who I uh, recognized earlier uh, who truly do represent uh, that house of loving kindness, the uh, commitment to giving back to the community, starting from the humble beginnings as that rural crossroad village uh, to the vibrant, bustling, urban core uh, that it is uh, today. And this pandemic has really demonstrated uh, that the way that people have stepped up uh, in order to uh, support community uh, efforts like nourishing Bethesda, feeding the hungry and others, it just uh, has really made me proud uh, to be able to represent Bethesda uh, and uh, to be a resident of uh, Bethesda. So thank you so much uh, to everybody for that. And I'd love to turn it over now to Wendy Kaufman with the Bethesda Historical Society. Wendy. Thank you. Um, good morning, council members. My name is Wendy Kaufman, and I am president of the Bethesda Historical Society, a nonprofit, all-volunteer organization dedicated to preserving the history of the Bethesda area. Today, we wish to thank our District 1 council member, Andrew Friedson, for his proclamation commemorating Bethesda's history and the vibrant Bethesda uh, we all know today, and to thank the entire council for its consideration of this measure. Council Member Friedson's proclamation recognizes the special history of Bethesda, its 150th birthday this year, and the relatively new Bethesda Historical Society. Two years ago, a dozen of us gathered in my family room and held what was to be the first meeting of the Bethesda Historical Society. Since then, we have expanded our core of wonderful volunteers, received 501c3 status, and grown our collection of Bethesda memorabilia. We have established an internet presence with our website and social media accounts, and we have sponsored community programs and events to share and celebrate Bethesda history. Especially relevant to today's commemoration of Bethesda's 150th birthday, are the two enormous Happy Birthday Bethesda banners gracing both sides of the pedestrian bridge over Old Georgetown Road in downtown Bethesda that community supporters helped fund. Thousands of people see these each day and learn some Bethesda history, which, of course, is an important part of Montgomery County history. We thank you for this opportunity to celebrate Bethesda's birthday milestone with you today. We will be sure to continue to keep you informed of our programs and efforts to preserve Bethesda history. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think we uh, have lost Carol Trawick, but I'll just say uh, few people have done more for a community than Carol Trawick has for uh, Bethesda. Uh, she's not here to hear it, so hopefully we can uh, uh, send this to her. But um, she is the Bethesda Arts and Entertainment District. She, uh, through her force of will and dynamism, uh, made that happen. Uh, she has provided so many of the uh, uh, institutions uh, within Bethesda, including uh, as uh, a former president of the Greater Bethesda Chamber, 
uh, previously and so many other uh, organizations, you literally can't take three or four steps in Bethesda without seeing something that Carol Trawick uh, has uh, committed herself to, not just with her, uh, her uh, 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 you know, uh, foundation, but also with her uh, personal uh, commitment, her energy, uh, and her hours. So uh, thank you so much to her. Thank you to all the residents of Bethesda, all the businesses in Bethesda, everybody who's joined us here today. Uh, we're so lucky to have such a great place uh, in Montgomery County, and uh, here's to celebrating the next 150 years uh, for one of the great places in our region and in our country. Thank you so much, and appreciate everybody joining today. Thank you so much for joining us and for everything you're doing. Um, Oh, Carol's here. Oh, I think you're muted. Carol, I think you're muted. You missed, Unmute. I just said really nice things about you. Oh, if is the two minutes up? It is, but if you want to say a couple words, if the, the council president's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, thank you, thank Please. you. I, I think it's just marvelous, Andy, and, and all of the council members uh, to recognize Bethesda's 150th. It's said that Montgomery County is the economic engine and the goose that lays the golden eggs for Maryland. Well, if that's true, then it follows that Bethesda is the one feeding that goose a lot of good stuff to produce those eggs. So since Bethesda is unincorporated, Montgomery County is our first level of government. So we really appreciate your taking time today to recognize our anniversary. But really 150 years is nothing in the history of our area because so many centuries, Indian tribes came down from the north along the trail we now call Rockville Pike to go fishing in the Potomac River. And Bethesda was an important crossroads then because tribes even came from the east and west to trade and for ceremonies. So over the centuries, Bethesda has continued to be a very important crossroads and connecting place for people. And in the 1930s, the newly formed Chamber of Commerce sent their members to this crossroads to count the cars for a 12-hour period. And their data convinced the county government to install the first traffic light at that intersection. So here it is, almost 100 years later, and things haven't changed that much. <laughs> As Bethesda is still a busy and productive crossroads and connecting place with people. And most certainly, one of Montgomery County's gems. So thank you for this commemoration. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Mr. President. Happy birthday to Bethesda and look forward to the next 150 years. Absolutely. Happy birthday, Bethesda. Thanks to all of you. And I just wanted to note if it's okay that uh, Carol Trawick is one of very few people on this earth who has special dispensation to call me Andy. <laughs> I was just asking about that. I want this one say, yes, yeah. Andrew, I, 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 I appreciate it. No, 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 no. No apologies necessary, only because it's you, Carol. Thank you so I'm much. I'm a grandmother, right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. You might have started a trend for us. Thank you. <laughs> I see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. <clears throat> Okay, thanks colleagues for those inspiring presentations. Uh, now we will have general business. Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements, agenda changes or petitions?
Yes, good morning, Mr. President. Good morning. We have a correction on the announcements. The Council will hold public hearings on FY22 operating budget and additional amendments to the FY21-26 capital improvements program on April 6th at 1.30 p.m. and April 6th, 7th, and 8th at 7 p.m. On the consent calendar for A, introduction to the resolution to renew council contract for audit services has been postponed. Introduction will be rescheduled for a future date. Also on the consent calendar for G, introduction to the supplemental appropriation to Montgomery County Public Schools FY21 capital budget, $5 million for relocatable classrooms, source of funds, current revenue general. Public hearing action is scheduled for 3-23-21 at 1.30 p.m. That is all, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, the clerk has also distributed the minutes to council members prior to the meeting for the meetings of November 23rd and 30th. Are there any changes? Hearing no objection, the minutes are approved as submitted. Now, the council can begin to sit as the Board of Health and get our weekly health briefing. Dr. Gales, are you ready to begin? Dr. Stoddard. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm ready to go, if you all are. I think we're ready to go. <laughs> okay, all right, well, good morning. <laughs> Happy Tuesday, uh, always good to be with you all. Um, I, If I am allowed to share my screen, I will go through the Pulse Report really quickly so that we can get that update out of the way. I'm sure there are some other topics that are are non-vaccine related this week that may bring, bring of interest. Uh, before I start into the Pulse Report, I would like to uh, to go through and share some of our numbers where we stand uh, in terms of our case numbers. So as you know, uh, we follow these indicators very closely to determine if we are making progress in terms of getting to lower levels of community transmission where we feel comfortable and safe uh, and confident that with the public health measures we have in place that the numbers will continue to improve. Now, last Tuesday, when the governor made his announcement about uh, reopening activities across the state on, on this past Friday, we actually had, uh, I think that there were 600, some just roughly over 600 cases reported across the state. Over the weekend, we did see a couple of days where that number did go over a thousand. Um, and so we're continuing to obviously watch those trends. Um, and certainly over the next week, we would start to see some impact of those activities reopening on last Friday. Um, and let me also be very clear, we are hoping that people, although uh, St. Patrick's Day is coming, we're hoping that people are wise and smart in how they celebrate and avoid high congregate situations. Um, wear their face coverings and not partake in activities that would put them in their communities at increased risk for increasing community transmission. So currently in the county, we our test positivity average is now slightly over three, and our case rate per 100,000 had dipped to below 10, but is now back over 10, which indicates a slight uptick in both of those measures from last Tuesday when that announcement was made. We're continuing to wait for more information from the state regarding uh, any additional variant cases uh, that may be across the state and within our particular jurisdiction. But again, for level setting of expectations, here's where we stand. Our numbers are, are still in that 10 to 15 range, which represents a high risk of community transmission. <laughs> uh, to pivot to vaccines really quickly, uh, this shows us how many doses that we have administered thus far. We have uh, we are, are outperforming the state average of 19.8% at 21.7%, uh, both in terms of residents receiving at least one dose, and then also those who have completed both doses or in the setting of the Johnson & Johnson dose, that one dose, uh, where we have 11.2% of our county population compared to 111 of the state who has been fully vaccinated. Uh, and when you look at the age breakdown, we are continuing to see improvements uh, in terms of the first doses for those older populations, 74% of our 75 and up group, and 62% of those who are 65 to 74. And this includes all of the doses administered across the state sites, as well as our hospitals, the local health department, and other facilities, including our nursing homes. 
the right side, again, updates where the, the folks who are eligible for doses as part of the county vaccine apparatus, um, again, all of the folks in 1A, 1B, and 1C are eligible for uh, eligible for vaccination, excuse me, with the exception of medical conditions, are eligible for vaccinations at the state sites. Uh, there is some difference. Uh, the state classifies those at the high-risk medical conditions and group two, we've included those as part of our priority 1C group. This shows you how we uh, are performing in comparison to our uh, other jurisdictions across the state. Uh, we have continued to have administered the most doses overall, uh, both first and second doses. Uh, and then the, the right side shows how we are performing in terms of the percentage of our population vaccinated. And as you recall, we were at some point below the state average, uh, and we're continuing to see improvements as we move up, um, recognizing that we do have a lot of people to vaccinate. And so percentages are a little bit tricky for us, given our large population size. Uh, this is vaccinations for uh, our residents across age uh, for our adults over 65, as well as our older adults who are 75 and up. And again, when we look at the, the, the percentage of doses administered by race and ethnicity, again, we're, we have lots of efforts on board to address this. Uh, the changes are improving incrementally, uh, but certainly we still see some gaps here, uh, particularly for our black and Latino residents. Uh, when we see we see some of those those racial and ethnic breakdowns hold when looking at breaking it down by age as well, unfortunately. Although I will caution that we are as we move to lower age categories and open it up in terms of uh, to more essential employees, we're seeing uh, the gaps in the percentage of population, the percentage of those vaccinated by race and ethnicity, those gaps improving. And we're hopeful that again, as it opens up more broadly to the general public, uh, that that will those gaps will 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 cease. Now we continue to explore and look at different opportunities in terms of how to address that. There's lots of strategies that have been put out uh, in terms of, for example, do we make adjustments by uh, for age by race? Or do we make adjustments by age for race? Um, there's some strategies some folks have proposed that we just simply do an age-based strategy moving down and uh, by age groups as opposed to different categories. We continue to look at those and work with our partners across the state and the region to discuss those best practices. Uh, this is the daily per capita vaccinations uh, received in non-Hispanic white population. So we see, again, this shows you that the per capita rate is improving over time, particularly as we have we've moved to different categories. Uh, this shows you the percent vaccinated across the county. The, green, the darker the green, the higher the percentage of individuals who've been vaccinated. Uh, this shows you our percentage of doses administered, uh, as well as the allotment, the all allocated doses that we've received. Uh, I would like to say a special thank you to the state for increasing our weekly allotment starting this week for the next several weeks. It did increase from 4,500 to 6,600, 6,500 doses per week over the next several weeks. And we are actively exploring how we can, again, additionally support the efforts that we already have in place and look at some other opportunities to partner with our community partners, again, to increase the scope and access to the vaccine within the community. Again, just another schematic to show you the percentage of doses that we have administered versus those that have been allocated. This includes those doses that were the increase in doses that we received this week. It's important to note that last week we exhausted all of our first doses by the weekend. And so we are excited to get more doses to be able to create more opportunities to get doses out to our residents. Uh, and just in the interest of time, we'll make these slides available, but we'll, we'll, we'll move through this because I know there's some other topics of interest, including athletics, to discuss. Uh, but these are just continual breakdowns of how uh, we are performing by race and ethnicity. Again, the percentage of those vaccinated by race and ethnicity is continuing to improve over the last several weeks. Um, and it, it's getting more closely to a representative sample of com com comparable to what our population breakdown is within the county. 
And I'm just going to remind folks here of the priority tier one zip codes based upon the surveillance and epidemiologic data. We continue to give some added weight to those communities in terms of the dose allotments, given the disproportionate impact of COVID within those communities. And here's a reminder of who is, as part of the county apparatus, who is eligible for our priority groups that are eligible for vaccination at those sites. So that concludes that portion. And I did want to, because I know it has been a topic of lots of emails that I have received, and I'm sure that you all have received as well. And I anticipate that it's likely a source of a number of questions you all may have. Uh, so I want to uh, share some insights to those watching at home and to those who sent us emails and, and so forth related to the question of sports. Uh, let me be very clear that uh, based upon the governor's actions last week and the pivot that the county has put into place uh, in terms of how we move forward making those restrictions or those uh, reopening decisions, uh, that, that responsibility now rests within the Board of Health's purview, which is our county council. And as the health officer, I will continue to provide the guidance from our team based upon evidence-based practices and clinical data. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have relied on a number of resources to guide the decision-making process for providing public health guidance related to different activities. One of these areas has been youth athletics and sporting events. We've looked at the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Maryland Public Secondary School Athletic Association for guidance related to types of risk associated with each sport and safety measures required to mitigate transmission as much as possible. It's important to note that these guidelines have changed. They've been updated uh, to reflect uh, best practices and information gathered. For example, an initial recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics was that kids not wear face coverings during sporting activities. Over time, however, they found more evidence to suggest that face coverings during sporting activities were a requirement and necessary, or should be necessary, excuse me, were necessary and should be required or recommended that they be worn in the field of play to mitigate transmission from person to person. We've had our own situations where when we've had sporting activities opened up across a host of of different sports, where we have had contact tracing investigations due to exposures and cases uh, secondary to contact within the field of play. Those sports have included football, hockey, soccer, cheerleading, basketball, among others. Now, risk determination was applied to each activity in sports, again, including those that I just listed, and were determined to uh, certain group sports, including football and cheerleading, for example, were determined to be higher risk sports due to their level of contact, the lack of distancing uh, available, and the time of duration of the type of activity. For those jurisdictions that have allowed uh, football activities in the state of Maryland, a significant number have resulted in large-scale quarantines. Most recently, six Howard County high schools were impacted by coronavirus exposures, resulting in quarantines for their athletics and some component of their schools. Recently, the Maryland Public Secondary School Athletic Association and other groups such as the National Federation of State High School Associations have removed risk categories associated with different sports and made allowances for these sports to resume. Despite the changes and the guidance provided from these groups, the factors that originally drove our public, excuse me, our public health guidance listed above have not changed and continue to raise concerns regarding the risks associated with those activities. Given that we are also uh, putting more students back in the classroom uh, this week and over the coming weeks, and we've seen sports be a conduit for more cases in schools, there are additional concerns about how this would impact in-person learning. So with all that, I say all that to say that we do have concerns about different sporting activities. Uh, now, I do recognize that based upon some of the actions taken last week, parsing out certain sports versus others, it has created a situation where folks are concerned about equity in terms of which sports are allowed. Um, so what I can tell you from the public health perspective uh, is that the guidance we are providing is that there are still concerns in place regarding these activities. If a decision is made to move forward with these activities, we would certainly recommend and strongly recommend uh, the inclusion of face coverings in those activities. 
Um, and from my understanding, that is consistent with the Maryland state law in terms of face coverings being worn in public places where physical distancing is difficult to maintain. But I did want to provide some insights to parents, others at home who are asking what we're using as a basis of the guidance that we provide from a public health perspective. And those are the types of things that we look at to keep your kids safe, to keep all participants safe, and ultimately drive down the number of cases of coronavirus within our community. Uh, I will stop there, happy to answer any questions, and turn the floor over to Dr. Stein. Or Dr. Kroll, I think Dr. Stoddard is. I think Dr. Kroll's not here, but Dr. Stoddard. Sure, I'll, I'll just, just a continuation of that uh, comment. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Gales provided his, his commentary, and I'll, I'll, I won't add much to it other than to say that obviously uh, our reference would be that the, that the Board of Health not punt such a decision about which sports are allowable to the letter of approval team. Obviously, they are, they'll do whatever you ask them to do to try and make certain things safe, but obviously if there's a decision to uh, – allow certain activities that should be made by the Board of Health and not by um, the, you know, not necessarily by the letter of approval team. Now, on the other topic that I'm sure we'll get questions about is the, the, the possibility of a state mass vaccination site, and I do have some good news to report on that front. So on Saturday, uh, emergency management, uh, health and human services, our clinical partner, Holy Cross Health, and uh, the Maryland Department of Health, uh, Maryland Department of Health, and the Maryland National Guard did a site visit with Montgomery College out to the Montgomery College Germantown site. Um, uh, Council Member Rice did join us on that visit at, at his request, and so obviously we appreciate uh, his being there and, and the support that provided by the County Council in advocating for and ultimately um, getting a good affirmative answer from the state that they will help us build out a site at Montgomery College Germantown. Uh, it will operate a bit differently than the other sites uh, that traditionally called mass vaccination sites across the state, which are truly state run. This is a case where it'll actually be a partnership between the state, the county, Holy Cross Health and Montgomery College to uh, build out this site. Uh, we will begin operating that site hopefully over the coming weeks. Uh, first, initially uh, as, a, as a more exclusively county operation to show, the, show its viability. But the goal is from both the state and the county and other partners to build the site out uh, to be a 3,000 dose per day uh, site. Obviously, as Dr. Gell said, 6,600 doses that we're receiving right now, that would be insufficient to operate such a site, and the state recognizes this as well. And so as the doses that increase uh, to the state, uh, they will in turn uh, look to increase the doses made available through this large scale vaccination site uh, obviously, if it's meant to do 3,000 a day, seven days a week, that's more than 20,000 doses per week at this one location. Um, that will not be our only location, and we fully recognize that there will be need to be others. And so, obviously, we will continue to operate additional sites, both community-based, uh, mobile, and others. And so, this won't be the only vaccination opportunity in the county, but will be likely the largest opportunity for mass vaccination in the county. Um, and so. Uh, we are working, there's a meeting ongoing, uh, literally as we speak, with Maryland Department of Health on use of their uh, mass vaccination site uh, scheduling program with our with members from our team. Uh, there will be additional site visits out to uh, Montgomery College with our Department of General Services and our Department of Technology Services. Department of General Services will actually be out there today twice, looking at the site, building out some um, you know, ramps for, for um, uh, access from our for disability community, looking at, uh, we'll be looking at power management, Wi-Fi at the site, all of those things uh, to really build out the site. And so the, the positive news is really that the state has given us a go ahead and they will be actively supporting us with, um, with, with real uh, logistical support to get this site up and running. And they are going to sort of recognize it as a partnership site with the state uh, as we build that out. So that's obviously very good news for Montgomery County and, and uh, is a recognition of the efforts of, of the county executive, the county council, and all of our uh, elected officials and others in, in really advocating for this site. And we're very much appreciative that the state has come through and, and uh, you know, recognize the need in Montgomery County to help us build it out. So I will stop there and I'm sure we can entertain questions. Thank you all so much.
Um, we, we're getting uh, more good news than we're accustomed to uh, this morning. So uh, that's that's uh, it's great to be in this position. Uh, you all were already working overtime, but I just, before I turn to my colleagues, want to thank you for all your additional work to guide us as we shaped and passed the Board of Health regulation on Friday. And I think, the, honestly, uh, even though we were under a very tight timeline and in a position we're not accustomed to being in, the fact that it passed unanimously after uh, extensive debate and review shows how, not only how united this council is, but how confident we are in your guidance and your ability to answer all the questions we, that we continue to get from our residents uh, and our constituents. So uh, again, thank you for um, fitting that uh, enormous amount of time on top of in, into last week's schedule on top of what you were already doing. Um, and as a parent of two uh, young MCPS students, I know my colleagues as well, thank you for uh, everything you did to get our schools to begin to reopen um, on Monday safely. That's a tremendous achievement as well. And I don't want that to go unrecognized um, we're all grateful to hear about the additional doses from the state that was reported uh, in your emails earlier, and we're thrilled. Uh, I know we're all thrilled to hear again about the um, the announcement about the movement by MDH um, regarding our pleas for a mass vaccination site in Montgomery County. So um, thank you all for um, driving the progress on that. Um, two quick questions. We've received a lot of inquiries from residents who are listed as eligible to pre-register on the county's 1C priority group, but they're not listed as eligible on the state's 1C priority group when they're registering for a vaccine. Um, examples are media, finance, IT and communications, shelter and housing are all 1C through uh, DHHS, but absent when you're registering for state clinics or hospitals. Um, has this been brought up to the state and what do you recommend we tell those residents? So I think this is one area where there is a little bit of discrepancy in terms of how we prioritize folks and how the state does it. It also includes those who are, you know, 16 and 64 with medical conditions. Uh, and so I think it's it's more or less of as we we anticipate as the state may move in terms of opening up vaccines to group two, which is where all of these folks would fit into, would coincide, if not be before before we as the county slide over and move to the rest of 1C, which will cover these folks as part of the county group. Um, so I would encourage them to pre-register with our site, um, you know, with the county site so that we have your information and move forward to that group. Uh, and, you know, we, we try to speculate <laughs> when uh, the governor will make a next move, uh, particularly related to the vaccine space. And we anticipate that there may be movement in that area in the near future. Is he having press conference today? Yes. He does. Yeah. And no, no word on what he will be announcing as much. No. Okay. I was going to add to Dr. Gale's answer. So if you look at uh, really what we're talking about here is that the state's phase two corresponds really to our tiers two and three of our phase one C. We designed our, our, our system with the Maryland uh, Association of County Health Officers, MHO. Uh, before the governor had announced his phases. So we just, because it was consistent in what flowed through, we kept it the same. But in the governor's phase two, there, there is a listing for essential workers. We've just more clearly defined what essential worker means beyond just saying essential workers and trying to really give it tiers and, and groups. And so uh, I do not expect that, uh, I, I would expect that if you use the county's definitions of essential workers as we, as the state moves into phase, uh, phase two of its response and one C, tiers two and three of our response, that they, they would be fine. They'll certainly be fine getting back, back vaccinated to the county sites, but frankly, I don't actually see much issue with them getting vaccinated through the state sites. Candidly, the state has, um, you know, certainly been pretty uh, generous with its interpretation when you get to the site for those activities. Okay, thanks. And it also seems many of the metrics, uh, like case counts and positivity rate are relatively low this week in Montgomery County uh, over the past week. Um, how do they compare to when restrictions were lifted over the summer? And does that, um, how does that go into your thinking uh, moving forward? So, well, the test, um, I'm going to, let me actually see if I can pull it up on my computer here. We can actually look at how that, um, look at the graphic representation of that. So if you permit one second, sorry. So I'm going to, if you allow me to share my screen one more time. 
So when you look at where we are, for example, back, this is where we were during the summertime period where the decision was to, um, to open up in general, but then open up to the phase two level, which would, in, which would represent increasing capacity. And so you look at our case rate during that time period, it had dropped to a seven day average somewhere 6.4. And we did have a couple of other days where 6.4 kind of, it was vacillating between 6.4, a peak of 10.9, but overall it was in the, the lower five to 10 range. So in comparison to where we are right now, we're at 10.6. So we still are at a higher level than where we were last summer when we opened up more extensively. Again, some of the differences are obviously we do have a higher percentage of, we actually have the vaccine present now, but we didn't have the vaccine present at that time. And so there's some things that we have to, you know, think through as we continue to look at the numbers. And then when we think about it from the, uh, the test positivity range, we are seeing the test positivity Positivity where we are right now is comparable to, you know, where we were back during the summer months where we were seeing two point, the range between 2.5 and 3.5%. Now, what is different from then versus now is we were also testing a higher number of folks back then, uh, where we have seen some decrease in the number of folks getting tested, not only just here in, in Montgomery County, but across the region and the state. All right, thank you for showing that uh, because I think that's helpful to all of us and our constituents because we're getting that question quite a bit. Um, and I very much take your point. I've shared, uh, and I, I know many of us have show, shared the map you showed, um, I think going into Friday, uh, showing Montgomery County with lower case rates than all the surrounding counties. I think we all take your point of if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, all the restrictions we've had in place are uh, the reason for that success and we wanna, we wanna keep that going. Um, I just had those two questions and then uh, I'll work with our staff um, to make sure we have regular updates on MCPS now that they're reopened because I think that'd be helpful to my, all my colleagues as well. Council Member Reamer. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, great discussion. Thank you, Dr. Gales, as always. Um, I just wanted to follow up briefly and, and express appreciation for your comments today on sports and your important recommendation that Outdoor sports still need to wear facial, you know, athletes need to wear masks. Um, I, I think that's really an, a crucial element and you know, the science on, on masking is crystal clear. Uh, and I know there, there has been denial about that issue out there in the world, but uh, it is crystal clear. It's one of the reasons why we have continued to main restriction, maintain restrictions on indoor dining because you have to take your mask off to eat. You have to take your mask off to drink. Um, but if you can keep your mask on, you know, and if all parties have a mask on, then there's far less transmission of uh, aerosols in the air. Um, so the good news is, uh, you know, what, I, what I'm hearing here is that provided we continue to require facial coverings, we can move forward with athletics. Uh, MCPS, for example, has designed a very constrained season. You know, it's it's not the... I don't know how many games are in the regular football season. I'm guessing it's at least a dozen. Uh, you know, th that's not what's going to happen. You know, it's a three game season this year, unfortunately for the, you know, for everybody, for the world, um, we're all facing these challenges, but uh, they, they have designed a three game season. And if we can come together on Friday, uh, we could approve very, I think expeditiously a, a, a new health order acting as the board of health, uh, I'm, one of my colleagues has informed me it's a 10 game season normally. So thank you, uh, Council Member Friedson. I know you're a big advocate for the athletic community. Um, we could uh, we could approve a, a regulation on Friday and then our teams could have practice uh, on Saturday provided. Well, I think for practices, they shouldn't hopefully have a problem meeting the capacity limits that are set otherwise for outdoor, but I know they will need to submit waivers so that they can so that our health team can impose, you know, the necessary requirements on how this would happen. Uh, this is not, we're not, you know, we're not saying this is Friday Night Lights. Uh, this is going to be carefully managed. Um, and as you said, Dr. Gales, there's no guarantee that there won't be transmission or that kids who are athletes, you know, won't uh, become sick. We can't, we don't know. And we don't know where they will 
have transmitted, you know, picked it up. Like none of these things are perfectly clear, um, but we think it is a, an acceptable level given all of the other constraints and our general progress on many areas and where we are in the in the big picture. Um, so I, I'll urge my colleagues. We'll we're, we'll continue working on an order uh, to come together on Friday. And if the athletics programs are able to have waiver approvals that are sort of pending, uh, they could potentially begin to have their, their, their practices on over the weekend. Thank, thank you. Dr. Gales. I was going to say, so thank you, Council Member um, I, I, I want to be clear, though, my, my statement was not meant to be an endorsement of activities. Um, I just I want to be clear that there are still significant risks associated with those high contact activities. Um, and any any activity should definitely have a face covering. You know, if that is the direction that is gone in, face covering should be um, a part of that. Um, but, you know, from the public health perspective, again, given what we've seen in other jurisdictions who have introduced those activities back and have experienced transmission and have experienced quarantine, you know, we would, we would provide um, extreme caution around moving forward in that area. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Understood. And, you know, this is not, none of this is going to be easy or, or smooth. And it's quite possible some of these games won't take place if we have a situation like happened in Howard County. We, we just can't be certain. But uh, appreciate your comments very much. And I know that a cheer will go up uh, with, our, uh, with our students who have had such a tough year, you know, frankly deprived of so much as, as so many other parts of our communities have been. Thank you. And not a line cheer. Council Member Jawanda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President and, and Dr. Gales. Uh, thank you as always, Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Bridges, Dr. Kroll in his absence because he's doing something that's probably related to, to all the work that you all are doing. So uh, really appreciate it. Um, just I'll, I'll follow up on the point where we just were, and I know I'm going to not say all that I was going to say, because I know others will say things. Um, I, you know, I've been very clear. I appreciate you always following the science on this. Um, you know, I think it was a, a jumbled mess last week that we pulled together very well as a team. Uh, as I mentioned, thanks to what the governor left us and we passed a, I think a very sound, uh, if not per, but not perfect because many, no things are, uh, order. Uh, I think we, where we did mess up and fumble to use the, the word appropriately was on the, uh, the, the sports issue. Uh, we, we shouldn't have differentiated. Um, it created mass confusion, led to a protest in front of our office, which was not socially distanced. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I just think it was a bad decision. So we're going to ho hopefully clean that up uh, going into next week. Um, you know, I, I have, I think I share with the, many of my colleagues that we should be treating all sports equitably. There should be masks in place. I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, and that there should be other protocols. I think, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about is, a, you know, some sort of testing regime and, and, and robust contact tracing. So I, I, would, I wanted to ask you all if you could just expound, if we were to move sports to medium risk and have contact tracing, testing, and mask wearing, would you all be able to assist with that or set those regulations out in such a way? And have you done that? Is there a model for that? And how quickly could you do it? Uh, thank you, Council Member Duando. So the, what you're referring to is a system that, uh, so let me take a step back and I don't want to eat up your five minutes. So let me try to answer this quickly. Still, a lot of people say, well, the college athletes can do it and pro athletes can do it. Why can't high school athletics do it? Well, there's a higher level of sophistication in terms of their ability to keep their athletes in a closed pod system minimizing their exposure to others but we've seen and you know you know my alma mater is duke we saw what happened with duke not being able to complete the acc tournament because they had a positive case that's why they're not I dancing mean, that's why they're not dancing this that's year. precisely why they're, that's the exact reason why they're not dancing this year that's the only reason why they're not dancing right um fortunately my other alma mater is university of illinois who's doing quite well this year yeah at any rate, so there's a different level of, of sophistication in their operations that they have in place that we're not able to fully emulate here at the high school level. Now, that said, certainly, uh, you know, working to uh, uh, have provisions for testing, uh, you know, to, to 
and find cases before they enter the field of play as much as possible is a best practice. Um, but the contact tracing piece is something that's already in place. And so we do have experience with this, as I referenced in my comments back in the fall when athletics uh, was restarted with non-public schools and with travel teams and club teams, we do have experience working within that, being able to do the contact tracing piece uh, within that. And again, this is going to be extremely, a little bit trickier because schools will all be open. And what we don't want to have happen, and yeah. as the reference back in the fall, we did meet with non-public leadership who were concerned about kids participating in athletics, particularly club sports and other things, who may come into contact and then come back into the classroom. And as a result of the contact tracing piece would then not only have the athletic team quarantined, but potentially segments of the school within the classrooms or other places. And I want to just add this one thing because in talking to colleagues across the state and getting some information from them on their experience of restarting sports is I want to, and I'm speaking directly to all the parents, family, and other folks involved in sports. If you are exposed and you find that out, we need you to be upfront and honest about that. We've had some situations in other jurisdictions where uh, the health department is being stonewalled by families and participants who aren't sharing that information for fear that that would cause the team to have to shut down activities. Let me be clear, that, that practice does not expedite the investigation, it actually drags it out and stretches it out longer, which mm -hmm. defeats the purpose of returning to play. So, sorry if I took up your time, but wanted to clear. No, no, it's it's important and I, I you know, I don't, we didn't technically hear the five minute rule, but I will abide by it roughly. It, the, uh, I appreciate that. Um, and so I think we need to work with you over this. You know, I think if we did it by Tuesday, it'd be fine. But I, you know, we can figure it out amongst ourselves when we, when it would be that you have the testing regime in place so that you mentioned testing is going down. That doesn't mean we don't have testing opportunities. We need to, this needs to be an area where we're testing at a high level if we're going to allow this, realizing there's risk and have the face coverings. And, and I know not everyone likes that, but we, we got to do that if we're going to allow and balance this. The last and thing I want to say, oh, right. I also add for timing wise, I think it's important. Right. And so if there's a, you know, if there is a need for the team to review a plan from, uh, like I, I have not seen the MCPS plan for football or other contexts where I haven't looked at. I mean, I know, I know information yeah. has been shared with the public health team, but I, I can honestly say that I, I haven't looked at it, um, or reviewed it at this point. So. Friday would be the desire way. to, yeah. there's a desire to have that all reviewed in advance of them. And I know one of the big things they're suggesting is, hey, we need to move to more, more contact based practices if we're going to have to play in a contact based game. And so thinking about the timing of all this, I just I think it's just important to understand that there will, like, if there's a desire to have the plans be reviewed in advance, we will need time to review the plans in advance. If there's an, if you're, if you're just going to allow them based on what plan they've developed, absent of any review, that, that's certainly the product of the, of the board of health. Uh, but obviously, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would suggest now, even in advance, I, we'll see where the council goes that you should just be looking at the plans now. I mean, from MCPS, yeah. just, okay, sure. just to, just to try to figure that out. Go ahead, and council Dr. member Jawando, just to quickly add, because I don't want to take of your time either. I think we, it's we all gone, so it's okay. Go ahead. And we've worked with MCPS to have designated testing vehicles in place for not only teachers and students in anticipation of the return and the potential risk or the increased risk for exposure and community transmission. If you go to our website, we have those spaces in place. And as you indicated, we need to test. We still have the platforms in place, and we are encouraging folks to get tested if they feel symptomatic or if they think that they've had an exposure. Got it. All right. And last thing I'll say, uh, I'll follow up with you on the equity. I appreciate you pointing that out. Obviously, we wrote our letter. You addressed some of those. I'll follow up offline. Um, how many teachers have we vaccinated? How, where's our progress on that? And that'll be my last question uh, and turn it over to the president. If you could just answer our progress on the teachers. As we had 19,000 mm -hmm. students, including four council students, I, I'm aware of at least. Maybe Councilman Reamer had one. No, no, his are in middle school. So Councilmember Hucker and I have we had four students of those nineteen thousand go back. So how's the how are the teachers and staff coming along with vaccination? I believe at this point we all of the MCBA staff have received an email to get vaccinated. I don't know the per, exact percentage of who have have, have actually received it, um, but I, my understanding is that they we have 
sent a registration link opportunity to all that we have had to be included in the county apparatus, recognizing that a, a large number have received it through uh, Johns Hopkins as well as other venues across the state. Great news. Thank you. Thank you. We for all. Thank you. I think we have another essential worker clinic this weekend. So we're going to continue to hold those kinds of clinics and there will be additional opportunities for MCPS. If they, if they missed the first opportunity, that's not their only opportunity is the key message. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Member Bramer. I'm sorry. Right. Council Member yeah, Thanks. Thanks. Didn't, didn't cross you out. My bad. Council Member Thank Nimato. you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you so much for this briefing. As uh, it was mentioned, good news. I think we all have, well, I know I feel like I have PTSD and I used to hearing good news. So I'm going to enjoy that and, um, you know, prepare myself for even more uh, good news coming our way. Um, well, first, I, I, I think that the sports conversation has been, you know, pretty much um, well um, discussed. I, I, you know, will restate, as I did last week, that, it, that I do believe we need to do things uh, across the board in the uniform, and uh, but recognizing that it was kind of a quick turnaround time, I, I'm a you know I'm cognizant of that and hope that we can address all of these other issues that have um, arisen at, at, uh, from that decision. I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, hear a little bit about you know what you are all discussing already regarding um, what President Biden has, of course, announced. You know this this goal of by May by May first that all uh, adults should have access, and I'm assuming, you know, pre-registration and all this. It's not that far away. It's like six weeks. And so I'm, I'm just wondering what conversations are taking place um, with our state uh, partners and what have you already begun to uh, do here locally to prepare for what obviously would have to be a major uh, increase um, scaling up in the overall operation. Uh, what what can you share with us? Obviously, the mass vaccination site um, in Germantown, that's really awesome news. Um, but just, just thinking about that and also such a startling, um, every time I see that map, uh, it is always startling to see that we continue to uh, have challenges in those areas of the county that, of course, um, we're all very familiar with, uh, where we continue to have major disparities. So what conversations are taking place? What have you heard? Uh, regarding this extraordinary goal, given that it's just six, about six weeks away? Uh, well, I, uh, I'll start. Um, I have Council Member, thank you, Council Member Navarro. Uh, before answering the question about the vaccines, I think it's important to highlight what you reference is six weeks away. And I know that we have all experienced significant COVID fatigue. We've been at this now over a year. But the window within which we're asking people to hold tight and adhere to the guidelines and adhere to the safety practices is not that long. If we can get to the point, we, we are near the finish line. And if we can get to the end where we can get significant portions of our population vaccinated, then that gives us an opportunity to take a deep breath, a sigh of relief, and be able to move forward in terms of opening things back up more broadly. And so what we're asking you to do is to hunker down for a little while longer, because as you pointed out, the end is near in terms of being able to get larger access for the vaccine. So in terms of, of what we're doing, uh, I think as Dr. Steyer pointed out, I'm sure he can go back and elaborate more on this, is the large site that is being worked on uh, at the Germantown site, which would increase capacity and be able to do multiple thousands of doses on a daily basis contingent upon the supply. Uh, we have, we will be pivoting out of the MCPS sites and moving to other community sites, um, you know, given that schools will be returning, but that's also created the opportunity to look at how we, what our staffing needs would be to ramp up that capacity even more and be able to do more doses within that space. At our current capacity, um, as referenced kind of in our 60 Minutes interview, is we could scale up what we're doing already just by getting more doses using that framework. But we recognize that we don't want to just rest on that framework. We want to increase capacity there. So we are, are looking at staffing opportunities. The second thing that we're doing is identifying community partners who could be conduits to provide the vaccine in other spaces, recognizing that we don't have to be the only one in the vaccine game but we can work and identify those partners strategically. We've been working uh, 
working with a host of clinics from our safety net clinics and Montgomery Cares to identify their capacity and get staff trained to stand up. We've done a couple of pilots with a number of those clinics so far and looking to expand there. We also have had some conversations with other entities to be able to come in and provide support in trusted venues within the community, including some uh, houses of worship spaces to again, increase access from a diversity perspective, uh, both by race and ethnicity, as well as from a geographic perspective, targeting those zip codes. And again, these would be other providers coming in who we would be able to supply doses that they could do, help us do the work and expand the footprint there. Now, the, the next thing is that the hope is that as the vaccine doses increase significantly, is that the state would then be able to provide doses to private providers and to providers within the community directly so that any of those operations wouldn't solely be dependent and relying on the county allocation as we are right now to support those efforts. And I think that will be a significant game changer because that would certainly expand the access from a community perspective that folks would have access to and allow the county allocation to be more of a safety net for those who are locked out of those other places uh, and continue to provide support for venues such as long-term care facilities and for other entities that wouldn't have access to private providers or retail pharmacies or, the, you know, for example, the large mass vac site that I would pivot over to Dr. Stoddard to share more about um, in that space. Thank you. Yeah, the one other thing, the, w w one big thing I want to add is, uh, and I know we don't often say this, but I actually agree with the governor's office on this sentiment too, which is that I, I don't want this to be a paper expansion to all adults by May 1st. It needs to come with vaccine. Uh, when we when we moved from one one very quickly into one B and one C the week thereafter, we were very critical of the governor's office. But you know, that was because they were receiving you know they they, they say they were receiving pressure to expand. I don't want pressure to expand to uh, predate vaccine available, and I think that's got to be the message that we send. Also, you know, I, I know I know we want to. You know, I support the president's goal. I very much hope that there's doses available to do it, but obviously I don't want to see an expansion into a group that we do not have the vaccine to support because that creates really terrible expectations. And so on, on the mass vac site, you know, just to be clear, the sites will operate very differently than other sites, but the ultimate goal is more vaccine at throughput and output in Montgomery County. And so 3,000 doses a day, seven days a week, it's 21,000 at least. You know, the state, candidly, they're, the, the National Guard team and uh, uh, Tim Tharp, who's the operations manager for the state mass spec site, said very easily this site could push four or 5,000 doses a day. And so um, there is more capacity even beyond that. And as Dr. Gale said, it, it's, it's going to be not just having, it's going to be a combination of large sites, community sites, and ultimately, I think the key goal in really going beyond where we're at now is getting the, pri the primary care providers directly involved. I know that we saw yesterday an announcement from MDH where they're going to start having some more clinics and other places getting vaccine. I expect that is a pilot of a much greater expansion to our primary care network. And then obviously the county can truly embrace what it is, which is this, which is a largely a safety net for those who do not have an opportunity to go to a primary care provider and will need to, will need that direct level support from the county. And so obviously, it's not just, we want to have mass back sites to really push volume, but we also are really working on broadening the partnerships to allow us to do a breadth of different distribution systems all at the same time. And we are developing those systems before we have the back, like just we said in this mass back site, we don't have enough vaccine to operate this site at full capacity. It will require an increase in doses. But the point is we need to have systems in place that can absorb additional doses and expand when those doses come, as opposed to waiting till the doses are here and then build programs to support them. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that. I think that the message is very clear. You know, six weeks, everybody take a deep breath. I know it's been difficult, but we have to, you know, stay the course. And obviously what I'm hearing is that the team stands ready. It's already proactively working to establish the logistics. Uh, and we will continue to, you know, be ready to absorb as vaccines become more and more available. I want to shout out our, you know, community partners, because I know that there have been so many already doing that work uh, in terms of vaccines, and it's kind of new, but I hear very good things, very positive things from the community uh, in terms of uh, gratitude for those community partners that are already 
doing that kind of work in, um, out there. So um, I think overall, it, it seems like it's, it's a very well-rounded plan and, and I look forward to, to more good news uh, on a weekly basis. Thank you. We're gonna count on you to deliver that. Council Member Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And thank you, Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Bridgers for as, as always uh, keeping us uh, on task when it comes to uh, ensuring that we're trying to stay ahead uh, of the COVID crisis. Um, I wanna jump into sports uh, very quickly because uh, it was very clear from our discussion uh, last Friday uh, that we were very concerned about equity. Uh, and so that has risen its head and we've seen it in the community. And so what we wanna do is come up with a solution. Um, I've shared with the council president and asked for us to actually uh, schedule something on Tuesday uh, for both public hearing and action uh, in terms of us to make sure that we can afford uh, MCPS uh, and uh, some of their teams uh, the maximum amount of time possible to make sure that they can continue planning and moving forward. Um, you know, uh, we made a decision on Friday, and I think that now that we've made that decision that we understand that there's risk associated and also requirements uh, that we need to set in place that are also associated, that we still need to move forward uh, and making sure that other sports like football and basketball and uh, cheer uh, and other sports that are out there that also represent a lot of our communities of color uh, in terms of their ability to do activities also uh, that are categorized just like ice hockey in that high risk category uh, are allowed to continue to play. And so from that perspective, I look forward to working with my colleagues. I really wanna thank, you know, council member Navarro and council member Juwando and council member Hucker. You know, we talked about that on Friday and said, that this was really important for us. And I think that Dr. Gales, I really wanna thank you, sir, for, for understanding uh, that while it may not be exactly what you think may be the best uh, direction for us to go in from a safety perspective, also do understand that now that we've made this decision in allowing ice hockey to move forward, we need to make sure that we can be equitable uh, in terms of our decision to allow other sports to move forward as well. And so, sir, I look forward to working with your office. I know I reached out to you and Dr. Stoddard over the weekend uh, to ask for some guidance in terms of how best uh, to move this forward so that we can still do it as safely as possible. I agree wholeheartedly with mask wearing, contact tracing, all of the things that you've recommended, sir. And so I assure you that um, my office will be working with you and, and my colleagues in terms of ensuring that uh, whatever we put forward addresses the concerns that you still have moving forward and that we do so in an equitable manner. Um, so with that being said, I did want to talk to you, Dr. Gales, about um, uh, the importance of testing. Uh, so much attention uh, has been placed on vaccinations, and rightfully so, and I'm excited. I really want to thank Dr. Stoddard and his team, who colleagues were incredibly impressive, so well-prepared, so knowledgeable, uh, and being able to say everything about why Montgomery County should and could uh, master uh, this site. And every single question that the state put before them uh, was answered and they were thoroughly impressed. I could see it in their faces. Um, but really wanna ask about the testing component of it, doc, Dr. Gales, because I know we still continue to see a rise of variants throughout the country. Uh, we still continue to see a, a disparate number of people of color being the ones that have more serious cases and continue to die. So talk to me a little bit more about why testing, especially at this point, uh, is so important in the process. Thank you, Council Member Rice. Uh, and as always, you know, we're happy to work with you all and come up with solutions and strategies to keep our residents safe. Uh, because at the end of the day, that's what drives us and that's what's important. So uh, to your question related to testing and with variant strains and so forth, what we are hoping to prevent is a situation where we see our European colleagues now, unfortunately having another wave of cases and having to undergo another wave of, of lockdowns as they work to increase the percentage of their population vaccinated in the setting of these variant strains. And so the restrictions and, and things that we are continuing to provide guidance on is to prevent us from, from being in a situation like that. 
Um, and one of the components to prevent us from getting there is if we get people tested and people continue to get tested so that we have a true understanding of what the incidence of new cases are within our community, allowing the contact tracing apparatus to step in and being able to identify those cases quickly, removing them from networks of transmission to prevent further spread to other folks. Um, particularly for those who are asymptomatic and unknowingly spread it to others, not knowing that they are positive. So testing remains an important component to our pandemic response. We simply can't just idly and passively wait for everybody to get vaccinated and hope for the best. We have lots of testing options available out there for folks to utilize. And this takes on added significance as well from an equity perspective, because let's not forget, as we open up more things in society, most, a lot of the folks who are staffing the, the services that we are asking to open up and increase capacity are disproportionately people of color. And so thereby they are at increased risk of exposure because whether we're talking restaurants, retail, across the board. And so conversely, we need folks to get tested to know their status to prevent from spreading and exposing folks in those settings from coming into contact. And we also need to make sure that as we continue to move forward in the vaccine space, we create more opportunities for those staff and frontline employers and essential employees to get vaccinated in a timely manner to offer an added layer of protection for them, as well as their families who they will be going back home to after working and providing those services for us within society. And to that end, we do have a, we are working to set up an essential employees focused clinic this weekend uh, to provide vaccines, which will put out more information once that's finally scheduled. But to go hammer home your point, testing is a fundamental piece because that's how we know what the, the burden of disease is within our society. And it gives us a better understanding of what those transmission patterns might be as the variant strains become the dominant strains of COVID in our community. Well, Dr. Gales, thank you very much. And I think, again, we need to just make sure that with our BIPOC uh, uh, health initiatives throughout the county, we continue to work with them, especially uh, with you and your department, to make sure that we're giving them the resources necessary and putting out public campaigns. So I'd love to work with your office in terms of just making sure that we continue that robust public campaign, working with our media outlets, working with our PIO office, uh, to really make sure that we're hammering that point home because I don't think that enough people are getting what you just said, which is incredibly important. So thank you very much for all of your great work. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Vice President Albert Nose. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it is good news regarding moving forward with the mass vaccination site that is going to be a game changer, particularly with the addition of the dosages per week. Um, it, it really is good news. Is there any indication, uh, this is obviously probably too soon, um, is, is that going to be Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, a combination of the three? Um, what What is the state indicated in terms of the dosages of Johnson & Johnson in particular? We won't, we don't, oh, sorry, but. Well, the doses that we're receiving the 6,500 right now are Moderna vaccines for the health department. But one thing I would want to throw out that I think is unfortunately lost that yes, we are excited to get more doses from the health department, but what we did notice also in the allotment of doses that were provided is that our hospitals actually saw a decrease in the doses. So the, the actual number coming to the county has not changed in spite of the fact that the state numbers have changed, the, no, but at the same time, the allocation to the health department. And so right now they are Moderna. We were told a couple of weeks to go after the first shipment of Johnson & Johnson doses is that from a national perspective, they exhausted the coffers to send all of the doses they had available. And it would be at minimum two weeks after, which would be next week, which would be the earliest that we would receive another allotment of Johnson & Johnson doses. I appreciate that. that. That's helpful. And, you know, there's I guess, always a little bit of a catch, but, um, but, but the good news is, you know, because of the equity framework that our public health team has put together, it's a net gain uh, in a variety of different ways for our community. So I, I appreciate that. I'll tell you, um, uh, on, on the Johnson Johnson front though, one thing we were told when we had the visit on, on um, Saturday with the state is that their intention is to prioritize the Johnson Johnson doses to the mass vaccination site. 
So at the, you know, depending on how many that, that may mean, I think there's, but mass specs like the five existing ones are capable of doing like 30,000 a day. And so depending on how much we, Johnson Johnson has received, all or most of the Johnson and Johnson may actually go through the state mass vaccination sites, meaning the five that are already in place. Uh, it's not clear how they would interpret this, this site that we're helping, working with them to build out at, uh, at, at Montgomery College, Germantown. But um, obviously, I, would, I, I don't know that it would be Johnson Johnson. It's, it's not, I would say it's not, it's not highly probable that it would be Johnson Johnson. Got it. I appreciate that. Um, and then I'm going to get to sports in a second as the second half of my five minutes because I have some thoughts on that. But um, just two other quick questions. One is, my understanding, I was seeing reports nationally, the percentage of deaths has, has gone down because treatment has really increased as we've learned all the way through. Um, just wanted to confirm whether that was true here in our community as well. Have we seen the percentage of deaths go down as the level of treatment op options has become more available and more known? I think to some degree, I think that, you know, certainly improvements in treatment as we move forward is a, a factor in that. I think one of the other components is, quite frankly, getting more of our older population vaccinated as well, because they were, you know, for example, in Montgomery County, um, at least in the beginning, what the big driver for our fatality rate were individuals living in congregate living situations. And so as we have added extra protection there, we're seeing the fatality rate in the older group shrink significantly. Um, it doesn't mean we're out of the woods, but at least for us, from Apple's, Apple's perspective, um, I think those two things, probably the, the vaccine piece a little bit more than the other one, because we're not always sure who's getting access to what in the treatment space. Uh, but certainly those two things have driven an improvement. I appreciate that. And then this is more of a comment. Um, I'm going to ask for confirmation. I know the answer, but um, for, for the public, uh, we, we have gotten some correspondence recently with uh, folks in the county expressing frustration that it appears other people from other jurisdictions and states have, have potentially received vaccinations in, in, in our county. And I just want to remind everybody that um, especially in the 1A category, you know, particularly for our hospitals, our health clinics, not everybody that works in those hospitals or those clinics lives in Montgomery County. They may work here, um, but they may not live here. So it is possible that there are residents from other jurisdictions and maybe even other states um, that are receiving vaccines here, but that's perfectly appropriate if those folks are working in one of the categories within 1A or B or C um, that's deemed high risk. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And I think, you know, it's also important to note that, you know, while we're, we're excited that our residents are getting vaccinated, there's a high percentage of our residents who are going to other jurisdictions yes. as well to get vaccinated, whether it's Prince George's, Charles County, Eastern Shore, Baltimore, City of Baltimore County. So, you know, from that perspective, you know, everything that you said, yes, but also keeping in mind, we've been fortunate to be able to utilize those other venues as well to get our, our residents vaccinated. More than 12,000 residents from Montgomery County have been vaccinated in D.C., for example. Mm. So it's not an insubstantial number of that. It, it's reciprocal. It goes both ways. That's helpful. And I think that context is important. Um, in my last two minutes or so on youth sports, um, I associate myself with the comments of my colleagues earlier. I'll just say a couple things that haven't been said so far. I think with the appropriate protocols as a baseline, as a floor, masks, active contact tracing, testing, um, the, the fact is that the main source of spread continues to be family gatherings and social gatherings. And I think there's an ancillary benefit to high school students who have to go through this additional rigorous contact tracing, testing, and leaning on each other to ensure that they are adhering to guidelines has an ancillary benefit. Uh, we've seen it in other sports uh, in which, you know, they, they hold, in sports, you hold each other accountable. It's just the nature of um, the organizational activity, which I think is part of the development process. It, you have to show leadership uh, in, in these particular categories. And so I think that there is, with the appropriate protocols, something to be said um, for particularly for a sport with the large percentage of uh, students that are participating like football, I think an, an ancillary benefit of having students hold each other accountable so that they can continue to play, so that they can continue to do the things that we know are so important. I've said this several times 
uh, before all of you before, but um, sports played a, a really important role in my development. And I can't even imagine uh, when I was a high school at Walt Whitman, when I was a senior at Walt Whitman High School, how I would have felt had my soccer season been canceled. You know, all, all the work going in through years of training, uh, you know, um, you know, supporting friendships and, and all of that. I just can't imagine what 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 that loss would have felt like. Uh, and I know it would have been devastating. And so as we've received the calls from parents, I hear the urgency and the emotion in their voice. And I can relate to it as all of us can, um, which is why I think that um, with the appropriate protocols, which I think will also serve as a model moving forward as we consider the transition back in, you know, in the fall, in the winter. Um, because the fact is the virus is, is going to be here for, for a while, even as we have herd immunity, because as we know, our teenagers and, and, and students and children are not going to receive the vaccination for quite some time. Um, and so I think it's, you know, the, the, that all sort of goes into it. So I know last week was bumpy. Uh, it, it wasn't exactly the way any of us would have liked, um, but as we've all stated and been on the record stating, uh, we were put in a very difficult position and did the best we could and processed as much as we could. Um, but I think those lessons learned can and will be applied by this body moving forward to ensure equity, to continue to evolve with information as we receive it. Uh, and I also really appreciate um, our, our, our education and culture uh, chair, um, who I know has been working with MCPS and their athletic department um, this entire time and his team uh, working to ensure, and, and I'm fortunate that he's on the HHS committee with me because uh, we've had numerous conversations about, you know, the complexities with relation to sports, but wanting to be able to move them forward in an appropriate way. I have a high degree of confidence in our MCPS athletics program and administration. They've demonstrated clearly through the reopening of their school process that they really get it. They take this seriously. Uh, and so I think with the appropriate protocols, we, we can move something forward. Um, and so I look forward to working with my colleagues over the next day or two uh, to develop something that, that does make sense and takes into account the very real and raw and practical guidelines um, that have continued to be provided by our public health team, which we so appreciate and respect. I think there's a sweet spot here and we're gonna find it. So thank you all. Agreed, and Council Member Glass. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Gales uh, and Stoddart for uh, what I think is encouraging news, is a host of encouraging news that you've shared with us today. You know, uh, the 11.2% the of Montgomery County residents that have been fully vaccinated and the approximately 21% as well who have received at least one dose. Uh, it's important to share that information in context when we look at our metrics quite frankly, because these statistics uh, are, are new developments and we're not here when we look at the data from, from last year and we try to compare uh, month to month. Uh, and clearly the most exciting news that has been shared this morning is that a mass vaccination site is coming to Montgomery County's Germantown campus. Finally, hallelujah. Uh, and so I appreciate the effort of, of all of my colleagues and, and Doctors Gail, uh, Dr. Gail and Stoddart and uh, County Executive and everybody who have been uh, harping on this, uh, that is, that has been an equity issue, right? For the largest and most diverse county in the state to have gone so long without a mass va vaccination site. So I, I look forward to hearing more of those developments uh, with Holy Cross Health and, and the college and everybody else involved as, as we go through that process. But you know, switching gears to the other topic uh, du jour, uh, uh, youth sports. So on Friday, we had a conversation about restaurants and movie theaters and youth sports and about how we return to normal or at least some semblance of normal. And, and make no mistake about it, we all share the goal of returning to normal. That is why we're providing vaccines. That is why we still have a mask order. That is why we are slowly opening up our restaurants, not at the same schedule as everybody else around us, because we wanna make sure the science and data help keep our community safe. And it's with that same lens that we're looking at youth sports. And let me remind everybody, Friday's discussion about ice hockey in particular 
was about a technical change, recognizing that in the health order, ice rinks are classified as fitness centers. And when I introduced that amendment allowing ice hockey, there were no other discrepancies in the order that had been identified. Now, during a very robust conversation on Friday, other questions were raised, in particular, particularly about the soccer plex and particularly about uh, where uh, basketball games are played. And so it was the first time we'd publicly had that conversation. And so now as we continue that conversation, we need to evaluate all of those sports and all of the places where those sports are played. It is not just about the sport and the risk associated with that sport. And let me remind everybody again that ice hockey is classified as a medium risk, not high risk. But as has already been said, we should not be evaluating those sports based on those simple risk factors. There, there are more factors that we need to look into, which is why we're having this conversation. And Dr. Gales, I appreciate the, the thoughts and uh, the, the consensus, the growing public consensus about how we can safely move forward. As, as tens of thousands of our students returned to school yesterday, we too need to continue some semblance of normalcy and doing so in a safe way. And, you know, I'll say this again. Also on Friday, we were talking about equity in youth sports. The waiver process that we approved, a blanket waiver process is not an equitable policy. It's not fair either because it is a subjective process for those sports and organizations that know about the process and there is no definite outcome that they would be approved. And so I, I second and third and fourth my colleagues' sentiments who say that over this next week, whether it is Friday or whether it is next Tuesday, we need to take all of this time to develop a better framework, a, a more fair and equitable framework where people understand what the outcomes are, what we're expecting of them to wear masks, socially distant, and do whatever it else is we ask of them so that we can return to some semblance of normalcy. So kids can once again become kids. They can play sports. They can prepare for whatever future they want at the collegiate level. They can keep their hopes of playing professionally. It's been a tough year for everyone, I know. But the data is showing us that all of our work is, has kept people healthy and safe and that we're gonna continue doing that. And that is my guiding light, and I know it's everyone else's guiding light as well. So uh, I want to work collaboratively with everybody so that we can get football players back on the field, we can get cheerleaders on the sides, we can get basketball players on the court, and whatever other sports we identify and in the venues where those sports are played, make sure we have a, a, thought, a thoughtful and thorough policy in place. And I look forward to working with all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, thank you very much. A couple of things. First of all, uh, really great news about the mass vaccination site. I just want to credit uh, Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, uh, Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Kroll, the whole team for that. Um, I wish we could take credit here for our public protestations. I think your work behind the scenes and frankly, our uh, county delegation in Annapolis and a lot of conversations and relationships behind the scenes is what really moved the needle on that. So I just wanted to uh, really lift that up and, and, and thank you for that. You know, if we can get up to 3000 vaccine doses a day, uh, you know, that is going to save lives, provide access to those people who otherwise wouldn't uh, have it. Uh, Council President Hucker has uh, shared extensively the amount of time it would take for a county resident, especially on transit, to reach uh, one of the other mass vaccination sites. and. Uh, you know, this is going to fix a, a problem. It shouldn't, you know, this shouldn't be like a journey uh, in, in the old west, uh, you know, uh, going westward uh, bound in order to get uh, life-saving needs. So I uh, really just wanted to lift that up and credit you uh, for that. And, and I think the fatality rate conversation, I appreciate Dr. Gill's your response to Councilmember Albernaz's uh, question specifically highlights why having a targeted approach to vaccines is important, why the prioritization of elderly residents, why hardest hit communities uh, are in an area of need. I've said this before, I'll say it again. It may not always be popular, uh, but uh, these aren't political decisions. They are 
public health decisions that keep everybody safe. If we lower the uh, transmission rate by uh, targeting to those who have the worst symptoms, have the worst outcomes uh, with the virus are most likely uh, to get it, we help to suppress the virus. That isn't for the individual patient, that's for the public uh, at large. And so uh, really appreciate uh, that conversation. I think we have to have more uh, of those conversations. I know we're trying our best. It, there's a lot of misinformation uh, out there. So uh, thank thank you for that. Uh, quickly, just wanted to uh, couple uh, make a couple points on the youth sports aspect. Uh, one, just a point of clarification. I think Councilmember Glass meant modified uh, ice hockey as medium risk. You know, effectively, the council approved modified ice hockey on Friday. Youth hockey specifically, which is non-contact, uh, that is the state risk category. Uh, that is a non-contact sport. There's no hitting uh, in it, so it is uh, different. I think there's been a lot of misinformation that's been shared, a lot of misunderstanding. Much of it is understandable given how quickly we were trying uh, to move to catch up to it. I'll also point out, as Councilmember Glass did, that we received a change in the order that we were trying to uh, address as suggested by the uh, health department to change the categorization for ice rinks to fitness centers. And the question is, whether the facility matches uh, the activity. So uh, we didn't make any changes to the risk categories um, and, and that was the decision uh, as, as we move forward. I will say, uh, first of all, I strongly do believe that kids need sports and uh, that that is an important part of their health, their wellness uh, and, and, and their mental well-being. Um, and I do agree with Councilmember Albernaz's points that it will help us with compliance. Uh, teenagers in particular, young people in particular, adolescents, have been some of the most challenging to follow uh, public health guidelines and having some sense of shared uh, accountability is helpful and to provide uh, as safe as we can uh, some outlets for young people to be able to uh, channel their uh, energy in a safe way is something that I think we need to be moving uh, more and more towards. I totally appreciate the risk factors and everything that uh, Dr. Gales, you've shared with us today, I think we have to find uh, a very challenging balance between these uh, competing uh, issues, but I do believe uh, moving forward with uh, youth sports in a safe uh, way, as we've discussed here, is something that we uh, ought to do. I had heard Council Member Reamer mention Friday. Uh, I know that uh, we've had uh, conversations about uh, Friday offline with the Council President, so I just wanted to uh, note that I am hoping we take this up Friday. Uh, although I appreciate uh, Councilmember Rice uh, me mentioning uh, Tuesday, but I think sooner rather than later to uh, address these issues would be uh, particularly helpful. Um, and I also want to point out that uh, you know I wish the MCPS return to sports guidelines, which I think have been carefully reviewed, included representatives from uh, Department of Health and Human Services, included. Uh, Office of Emerg Emergency Management uh, personnel have been collaborative uh, throughout the process, have been extremely well uh, thought out. If that was before us on Friday, which I wish it were, I would have voted for it. I would have been pleased uh, to, to vote for it uh, and support it. I wish that it had been thought of. I wish that it had been brought up. It wasn't. Um, you know, unfortunately, we were moving very quickly and we were trying to do uh, the best we could with uh, the information uh, that we had. If we were moving on a more methodical timeline, if we weren't put under the uh, the deadline that we were, I think uh, we would have been able uh, to address that. But you know, I think there is a plan in place. I think it is a thoughtful plan. I think it is included uh, collaboratively uh, uh, public health. So I hope that uh, as we take the next step on that, we can move forward as quickly as possible. And I don't think it should just be uh, for football and cheerleading and palms and the MCPS return to sports. I think we need to find a way to provide safe outlets for young people uh, to follow health guidelines, to avoid risky gatherings, particularly those that are unmasked, particularly those that are unsupervised or relatively uh, undersupervised, so to speak. Uh, and uh, we need to provide uh, you know, a gradual move towards some sense of normalcy to allow folks to continue to take action to keep each other, keep themselves uh, safe so we can continue to hold each other accountable. So um, look forward to being able to uh, move on the MCPS return uh, to sports plan, a broader strategy on all uh, youth sports. And uh, I'll just lastly say the risk categories 
as we heard earlier, are no longer in play. We've been told not to use those at the state level. So some of the confusion that was created based on the different risk categories for uh, younger youth modified hockey and uh, you know older contact hockey uh, and, and, and other uh, dynamics. I think in the order as we take it up, I just want to note here, we should eliminate references uh, to things at the state uh, level like the risk uh, categories because we've been told uh, to no longer abide by them. So um, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you again to Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Kroll for all of your uh, efforts, your guidance, and I know we'll continue to work through these uh, challenges and try to make sure that our residents stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Freetson, uh, and thank you for the clarification. I was going to highlight with the modified hockey versus contact hockey, um, and I, I wanted to make one comment. So, uh, in my my pre prior life uh, practicing medicine as a pediatrician and focused on uh, adolescents and young adults, uh, you will find no bigger advocate for recognizing the space that adolescents and young adults do need for releases and outlets, and that includes you know, sporting activities, access to, you know, we're having this conversation, you know, continued access to behavioral health services, both from an acute and long-term perspective um, and checking in with our kids. One of the other risks that I want to highlight is and ask folks at home to underscore what's been discussed here already is, is ensuring that kids do adhere to those guidelines and their families adhere to those guidelines as well. Because unfortunately, what our experience was in the fall and the winter when we were dealing with sporting activities were uh, teams who were not adhering to the guidelines. Um, a number of instances, including, I believe, a football case as well as a hockey case where we had folks who were exposed at family gatherings who were not adhering to guidelines that put the kids at risk of exposure, who then brought it into the field of play. So we can put all the safety parameters we want in place to ensure that the field of play is safe, which we no doubt will, and kudos to the staff at MCPS, Dr. Sullivan and his team. Uh, you are correct, Councilmember Friedson. There were representatives from public health as part of that process. Us. Uh, and again, we we enjoy working with MCPS throughout the pandemic uh, related to coming up with safer practices. But in order for the field of play to continue to be safe, we ask people to adhere to those guidelines at home and not so you're not putting your kids at risk of bringing it onto the field that would put other athletes at risk and result in large scale quarantines across the board. Here, here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gales, I'm getting in real time the question. Um, I know it's uh, a little ways from being stood up, but how do physicians volunteer to administer vaccines at Montgomery College? Well, I think the, the, the procedure to volunteer with the county that we've had in place uh, is, is consistent throughout the pandemic. We've asked that uh, physicians go through the Maryland Reserve Corps. Uh, so they've, since they've got a formal process that they can go through and vet and check their licenses and things like that. And then our volunteer coordinator is Jessica Pryor, who also who is, has served in that role throughout the pandemic. Uh, and so there's two things. We ask that folks register with the Reserve Corps. And if they're interested, they can send uh, an email to jessica.pryor, P-R-Y-O-R, at montgomerycountymd.gov so that we have your name and information and we can have it on file so as we move forward with the staffing component of that opportunity we would be able to have that outreach and have the information to contact folks terrific thank you councilmember katz thank you very much council president um first off it is good news about the mass vaccination site and I want to thank everyone involved councilmember Rice, I had a feeling if you were going to be there that they couldn't say no, that, as with Dr. Stoddard and anybody else there. But let's face the bottom line. It was the right thing to do. We haven't gotten there yet, but it was the right thing to do, and it certainly was, is being recognized. As for football, I'm somebody that believes we should have the discussion on Friday. The sooner rather than the later to say, well, we'll get to it in another couple of days. That's not fair either. We're talking about people that need to be practicing. We're talking about people that in education is not only in a classroom. We're talking about people who are who in many cases are looking at football scholarships and other sports scholarships. So the sooner we can get to it, 
I believe would be we would be better off. Secondly, on the the whole idea, and I do believe that we need to make certain that the players themselves, to Dr. to Dr. Gale's point, that that the coaches and everybody else reinforce you you know this is we're going to have these games, but you have to make certain that everybody on your team is safe. If you cannot do what Dr. Gales was suggesting, is it a family gathering, not wear a mask and do all the things that are so very necessary, <clears throat> excuse me, that a coach can certainly reinforce and does a wonderful job reinforcing. I do have a couple other questions. So let me be clear. I think we should have this discussion on Friday, but I do have a couple other questions. It's been asked of me about um, whether or not someone uh, who was who was allergic to the mRNA uh, vaccines, the, the Modernas, whether or not they could request a J, uh, 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 Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Is that a possibility? I think so. I mean, as part of the pre-registration information, they can make that information known. Again, we're working with a limited amount of Johnson & Johnson doses, until, you know, until we get another supply. But I don't... Um, you know, we can talk about that online, and if there's a, an individual who has that specific concern, they can email us, and, you know, we can respond and work with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And they may, depending on availability, they may, it may delay their vaccination by several weeks, and, and it, candidly, if the state stops giving us Johnson & Johnson, you may have to go to a mass vaccination site as opposed to coming to a county site if that's what happens. And so but, it's all based on availability. But, but if they're allergic, they... Yeah, yeah. You know, they no, agree. Yeah, yeah. We, may not, we may not have a dose to give them if if we don't get Johnson & Johnson, I think is the point. So if we have it, I think we can work out a system, but we have to have it. And when we talk to our friends at the state, if somebody could suggest that for them as well, in case there is, and, and I don't know how many people that actually affects, but the people it affects, it certainly is very important. And what, and, and I think we've sort of touched on this, but what happens or what accommodations can be made for a resident who gets their first dose at a mass vaccination site experienced an allergic reaction and are medically advised to receive their second dose in a medical care setting. Is there ways that that can be figured out as well? I think the best mechanism is to have them work through their medical provider if they have one to help facilitate and navigate that. Um, and again, in, in those situations where there may have been complications, they can contact us directly so that the team can work with them individually, respective of their circumstance, to help them navigate and figure out how to best best do that. Okay, thank you. And um, and and is there is there a way that we can? And we've had these discussions, and I know it's a difficult discussion. But is there a way that we could give some industries? And I'm looking at the the the. Uh, the uh, catering industry, a, a, a possibility of saying, if we meet this matrix, if we meet these 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 uh, these this criteria, that you could could start to um, book people for weddings and other and other events. They're being able, their competition is being able to do that in Frederick and and other places now. And right now, somebody is saying, look, I want to have a wedding in, in X, whatever it is, days or six months, and they're not, they're not able to have that business. They're not even able to have that discussion. So I do believe it would be helpful, and I know we can't do it this morning, but I do believe it would be helpful if we could give some relief so that these businesses, these catering businesses and other businesses that are affected by dates not this week or next week but beyond, that they would be allowed to have some some semblance of what might happen. So please keep that in mind. So we actually have a mechanism in place now. So with the, the team that reviews the, the, the different proposals and things that they submit, the guidance that we've provided back to them is, you know, coming up with multiple contingency plans, you know, trying to map out as best as possible uh, within that, recognizing that, you know, if an event is six months from now, it is a like it's good likelihood that they would be able to match this capacity, but again, coming up with different contingency plans, respective of what could potentially happen. So we're open to having those discussions. You're right; it is impossible to predict. But to the comment earlier, I believe from Council Member Navarro's question related to the six-week window, 
Now, I think a lot of a lot of our ability to prognosticate about the future will be impacted over the next six weeks or so. I know that wouldn't provide an immediate answer for them, but I do think it's a potential game changer where that changes the landscape where you know the idea of having a high a high capacity event with you know, hundreds of people versus 25 to 50 is a lot more realistic, and we would be able to be more confident and support them in putting forth that type of proposal. And, and that, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I know the industry would appreciate that. So how, who do they contact if they're looking at something like that? How does that conversation begin? They can well, through the LOA portal uh, at a plan. But uh, candidly, I think what many of them in our conversation with them, what they're looking for is if we schedule an event, will you guarantee we can have it? And we candidly, we can't do that, right? So um, it gets tricky because if they want to schedule, you know, if you're if you're if you're a family trying to schedule a wedding, understandably, you're looking at say August, and you want to have um, 175 people there. Well, we you certainly can. They can a caterer can book that right now if they want, but we can't guarantee them today that. 175 will be a permitted level through the Board of Health regulation or any other regulation at, the, at that time. And so they're looking for a guarantee and not have to cancel, but candidly, I I don't know how we could give them a guarantee. Well, I, and I understand there's very few guarantees in life, but but I do believe that at least if they understand that it's a it's a good possibility, and, and if we're certainly with with the all the caveats that say that you know that that if something changes that, that you know that we're going to have to to uh, let them know and give them ample time to let them know. But the bottom line is, if they say you can't do it, but you can have it in Frederick, the same 175 people, that becomes a problem for them as well. So that that is an, another issue. And and then the, my last question for the for today on this one is, when state property, if someone decides to have an event at the um, in a in a state park, are air are, are, are air orders or is the are the county orders um, covered in a state pro, um, park? I can't really know the answer to that, but so I know Ms. Kinch is watching this, and I'm sure she's going to text me in the next 30 seconds to answer that question. Um, so uh, uh, I will answer it. As, uh, I don't I want to find an answer for that. Uh, so I will try and answer that for you all. Okay. And, and, and if you can't answer it in, while we're speaking, which my time, my, my time is up here, but, but if you'll just let me know so I could, could forward that to the person that asked me that as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Rice. So I'm a big fan of revisionist history. <clears throat> I remember on Friday uh, when it was Council Member Jawando that said, uh, hey, we need to wait and come back this Tuesday, today, uh, so that we could discuss all sports together and try and move something forward. To which Council Member Katz, you, and other folks said, no, we don't want to wait. We don't want to do it. So it's interesting that all of a sudden now there's an impetus to move forward when before we were asking for all of them to move forward at the same time. Nonetheless, here's how we need to move forward. We need to make sure, as we heard from Dr. Gales, that we have something that's safe. Keep in mind, when it comes to our sports, like cheerleading, like football, like basketball and others, they are represented by our communities of color, the same ones that we've also been on this call talking about that are at higher risk. We need to make sure we get it right. And so, again, I've been talking to the football advocates. I've been talking to the folks who are very upset and want things to move forward. They're, we've been talking all this weekend. We've been talking all day today. I feel as though if we can get something done by Friday, that's great. I don't want to rush something that's wrong. Uh, and so, again, um, just for the sake of now that the pressure is on and folks are like, hey, why didn't you do this for these other sports? Folks are all of a sudden now ready to move forward uh, with doing something that we asked to be done last week. So that being said, let's figure out the best way. Certainly I am open to Friday, but from what I understand in terms of what it is that we need to do and talking to Dr. Gales and to others uh, that we need to devise uh, a plan that encompasses what Dr. Gales is talking about is going to take some time. If we can get it done by Friday, and keep in mind, we still have to post notice for the public hearing, all of those kinds of things, that's great. 
But again, we want to lead safely, right? We want to put the time in to making sure that we get it right. We don't want to hastily do what we all felt as though we were kind of forced into on Friday uh, in terms of a hasty decision. We want to make sure that, especially with this one, because we're talking about such a large cohort and folks that are more at risk, that we get it right and make sure that we lead with safety and with equity. And so from that perspective, that's the reason why I had said Tuesday, I had floated that out to the football advocates in the community and told them Tuesday, I understand that it's not the exact time frame, but hey, the exact time frame that Council Member Juwanda was asking for was this Tuesday. So, you know, we're already past, you know, what, what would have been a convenience and we really need to make sure that we get this right to ensure uh, that we can uh, really give our students what they need, the opportunity to play, but also the opportunity to do so safely. And so that's the reason why I was pushing for Tuesday. Just wanted to make sure that was correct for the record. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Katz. Thank you, and thank you to Council Member Rice, uh, who, who uh, for setting the record straight, I am guilty. There was no question, and I was one of the guilty parties that said, let's do it now. And, and I'm one of the guilty parties that says, let's do it on Friday. So I appreciate that. What I am suggesting is that what we could do, what we could do is we could even post right now that we are attempting to have this meeting on Friday. If it doesn't work, at least we're trying our best. Uh, you know, I hate to use these football analogies. Really, I don't because it, but the, our goal should be that that is what we're attempting to do. And I noticed that Earl earlier on said we were going to punt. I wasn't going to even mention it, Earl, but you did say that. But, but bottom line on this is that we need, and, and I understand people understand that we're trying our best. We are, but the, we need to, if we can do it for Friday for practices and everything else associated with it, I think that would be a reasonable goal. If we post it and we can't do it and we have to postpone it, at least we've tried our best. But at this point, I think we need to get past this as quickly as we can, keep everybody as safe as we possibly can, and move on. So I'm I'm an appreciative person for everybody working together. Thanks. Thank you. If I may, uh, I did get an answer from Ms. Kinch on Councilmember uh, Kathy's question earlier. Our rules do not apply to state property. So that answers your question about parking. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stern. Great. I don't see any other. Mr. President, just, just very quickly, can we hear from Dr. Gales as to whether or not they think that they may be able to have something? Uh, mm -hmm. I know I've been it just as of two minutes ago in conversations with uh, Jeff Sullivan with MCPS uh, Sports. And so, Dr. Gales, can you comment on whether or not you actually think we can get something done by Friday so that we can schedule this now and be done? I think so. I mean, I, you know, again, the, the, we've had representatives from our team participate in those deliberations and, you know, looking at the guidelines, I will commit to, um, I will carve out some time today to circle back and review them to make sure there's no red flags. I don't anticipate that there will be, um, and, you know, create the opportunity. Like I said, we worked well with MCPS across the board and, you know, in the athletic space. So I think we can put we can iron out and hammer out any details that are, you know, concerning um, and make it happen for you all by Friday. So I, I would commit that, that we can we can do the best we can to do that. And, 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 and because I want the, correct, the record to be correct, uh, emergency management has had participants in this the committee as well. I have not seen the, the football, which is football plan, which is which is still accurate. But we'll work with the with the people who've been sitting on these committees uh, between Dr. Gales and I and review what what's been proposed and get you all something for Friday. Excellent. So so. Mr. President, with, with that being said, um, I think that, you know, we can rescind the Tuesday and go to Friday uh, and we'll be able to do something safe and effective by then. Agreed. I think we'll all block off time on Friday. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, doctors, uh, if you're not careful, we're going to get used to this and expect uh, groundbreaking good news every week. Um, but thanks for all your advice. Always happy to give good news. We're going we're gonna to make Dr. Kroll deliver any additional bad news, and so yep. we'll stick to the good news. Okay. And he's not here. He's hereby assigned the bad news from now on. Um, thank you uh, all for all your hard work and advocacy. We really appreciate it, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, colleagues, now we'll uh, take up the consent calendar. I just need a motion to approve the consent calendar. 
Let's approve the consent calendar. Thank you, Councilmember Reamer. Is there a second? Councilmember Reamer seconds. Highly controversial. Does any member want to speak to the consent calendar? Okay, we have a motion from Councilmember Reamer and a second from Councilmember Fritz. And all those in favor, please raise your hand. Excellent. My hand off screen. Oh, excellent. Okay, so that is unanimous. We'll take your word for it. Um, the consent calendar passes, and 